Uh, by popular demand, our chair has asked for a couple of minutes uh, to deliver some prizes. Uh, so he has the floor. Do I get one? No. <laughs> so uh, I'm here to deliver the Kirkpatrick Teaching Assistant Awards. Uh, these have been given by Stanford Physics for over 30 years um, in, the, in the name of Paul H. Kirkpatrick. It was um, established to recognize graduate students who have demonstrated a talent for and commitment to the teaching of physics to undergrads, and thereby exemplify the dual commitment to teaching and research characteristic of Kirkpatrick's own life. Uh, he was a member of our department for 28 years before retiring in 1960. He lived until the age of 98, passing away in 1992. Uh, he was well known for research on uh, x-rays, the x-ray microscope, and for his pioneering work in scientific holography. Um, he's also very famous locally for his championship of the importance of excellence of teaching in physics. Uh, his strength of character, integrity, and compassion were much admired by his colleagues. So uh, many of his awardees have gone on to distinguish teaching careers in physics. And this year, we're proud to recognize two more. Uh, the first is Kate Coppas, uh, who I think is up there. So uh, Kate uh, has been a TA for electricity and magnetism and mechanics and heat. And she genuinely enjoys working with students and sharing her love for physics. Is this for you? Uh, students have commented on her patience, humor, and willingness to meet outside office hours and class time. She is very approachable and explains concepts at the student's level, making it easy for students to find connection with her. And one student commented, she is really in tune with what we want as students. The student also commented, she was not a pushover, but was gently firm. So, congratulations. <laughs> We have a second awardee, uh, because we just have too many great student teachers. Uh, Quinn McPherson, is Quinn here? Uh, so Quinn is also a TA for light and heat for mechanics and for statistical mechanics. Um, the students say he was very good at coming up with particularly crisp, simple analogies and explanations of complicated phenomena. Um, and at the physics tutoring center, he was known um, not so much for answering students' questions as for asking them questions instead which ended up teaching them a lot. Congratulations. Good afternoon, everybody. It is my uh, great pleasure to uh, have uh, my colleague Steve Libby uh, here to give a colloquium today from the Livermore Lab. I've known Steve a long time. Uh, and one of the reasons he's here is because uh, I want to model for many of you, what it's like to be a real physicist, like I say, with a small p. So uh, Steve is a person like myself who strives very hard to do that, and he has a resume that is just awesome. I'm going to give you some examples. When he was a student at uh, Princeton, he was working on field theories of basically, he explains, uh, field theories with solid comes and then basically polycarp monopoles. He went on to do a postdoc on um, factorization theorems in QCD that are important for analyzing experiments. From there, he switched fields and became the co-author of one of the seminal papers on the quantum Hall effect written in the old days, uh, the one that uh, identified what had gone wrong with the, uh, what we call the Daniel Core scaling theory of localization and the presence of magnetic fields. Uh, from there, he switched again and he joined the X-ray laser group at Livermore and was involved with the bomb pumped X-ray laser. I will say, I know something about that. There's the part that worked and the part that didn't work. Steve is the part that worked. Uh, he, uh, has uh, run the uh, equation of state group, uh, theory group at uh, Livermore, uh, which is a complicated job uh, that involves uh, managing experimentalists. He has worked with experimental analysis of the uh, actual lasers looking at X-ray interferometry made by the amplifying lasers, X-ray lasers made in the amplifying medium powered by regular lasers. Uh, and of late, he's become very interested in cold atoms and what we might call the downstream analysis of the data required to pull small signals. 
out of uh, uh, accelerometer, very sensitive accelerometer uh, experiments for many things, including uh, weapons forensics. I mean, looking at terrorism, terrorism forensics. So Steve has a, 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 a deep and, uh, well, let's say deep and impressive uh, resume. Today, uh, he's talking about um, one of my favorite subjects, which is what you can do with big lasers making otherworldly matter at extremely high densities and temperatures. Thank you, Bob. It's hard to rise to that introduction. I think I'm supposed to put this on my lapel. Is that right? And the button. I think I've got that. Oh, there, that button. Right. So, and let's put this up here. Oops. Here. Okay, can people hear me all right, or shall I use this gizmo right here? My booming voice works? Good. Uh, sorry? I think you should use the microphone. You think, okay, well then I will. So let's see, we're on, is that better? Yeah. All right, maybe you'll regret it, I don't know. And let's button up with this thing right here. I'm very electronic, okay. So it's a pleasure to talk to you today about one of my uh, very Livermore-esque, but uh, long-ranging kind of uh, hobbies, which is, as Bob said, you know, what you can do with very, very powerful lasers. And um, so it, I'll get, by the way, to the end, to this enormous list of collaborators and people who taught me so much about this subject. This is hardly something that I did by myself. And for, I don't, for an instant, in any part of this, want to give that impression, because I have a marvelous, actually worldwide collection of collaborators. So. Uh, so, you know, here shown as a rather glitzy chart, log log chart, is sort of the playing field for high energy density physics. And just for the sake of definition, we would define this as basically um, when, you, when matter in solid density begins to dissociate. So you, it's at about a megabar of pressure where you have about an electron volt per atom or particle and dramatic things start to happen. Of course, we go way above that, you know, as this picture shows, um, you know, the, the, the boundary of a megabar partially due to radiation pressure on one side irrespective of the density and partially due to the internal constitutive properties of matter on this side, you know, goes on up to, uh, you know, typically astrophysical objects that are far higher density. So for example, were we to achieve ignition at Livermore, we're still trying, that would be a terabar of pressure at the point of ignition, which is quite striking. Uh, the, the hot spot, for example, in a burning capsule begins life at 10 kilovolts, and the density is rather higher than by a factor of 10 or so than standard density. And so, you know, there's, you know, a bunch of motherhood statements about what goes on there. You know, along with strong ionization, which I implied, very strong electron collisionality, radiative energy transfer, which from a, you know, it's a subject I personally worked on a lot, and you'll see it figures as important in this talk, becomes the key way that matter talks to itself inside of this medium, as against in the normal manner, where it could be electron collisions or something like that. Um, just to set the thing, the, the scale here, pressure of air, you know, and kind of mixed units here for whichever ones you like, is about a millionth, you know, it's a bar, so it's about a millionth of the, of the, of the pressure we're talking about here. And because experiments are so important in getting at the truth of anything, including this subject, um, it's important to say that for the things I'm going to show you, the time scale over which you're able to measure things driven by these lasers, um, you know, trades off against the energy density you can achieve, how high up this picture you're going to go, as well as the volumes. And that gets into experimental details. We don't like gradients because it means you're measuring things that are averaged over very different conditions. And very often that means you know, giving up some of the enormous oomph we have in these lasers or pulsed power machines for a larger volume, but one that is well characterized. And that's a question you should always ask. If you want to act smart in an HED seminar, just say, hey, wait, 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 what about the gradient? And then people will crawl under the table because they'll know it's bad, you know. So anyway, there you go. Um, so a little bit, um, uh, you know, kind of about the playing field with respect to a specific material. And I, I suspect this audience kind of knows all of these things. So this is a picture and a small subset of the diagram I showed before of the uh, equation of state behavior. So this is thermal equilibrium behavior. We're going to go out of equilibrium very soon in this talk of hydrogen. And so places like, you know, the interior of Jupiter, uh, shock experience on uh, experiments on, on deuterium, uh, and so 
so forth are on here. And then there are different physics regimes here. For example, you know, the, the uh, plasma coupling parameter, which is basically the ratio of how strong the Coulomb interactions are in the medium versus the thermal energy in the medium. If that number goes above one or starts to get much bigger, then we feel that we're strongly coupled and there are long range correlations in the medium. Uh, Fermi degeneracy, for example, here's the line of that. It, it scales with density in an obvious way over here as you know, the density to the two thirds power. And again, that divides different regimes. Um, in other units, and again, it's probably well known to all of you, you know, we can rewrite the plasma coupling parameter in terms of the Debye screening length and the electron density. So what goes on here, in, and oh, by the way, other than its practical applications, I hinted at laser fusion or making x-ray lasers or things like this. Why is it interesting intellectually, actually? Because generally speaking, if I heat something up, and of course astrophysics is great and we want to understand that, but if I heat something up, all the sort of subtle stuff, like I worked on with Bob for all these years, goes away. You know, there's no correlations. You don't have all the competition of all these infrared singular states, you know, which motivates a lot of condensed matter physics. So, you know, why do we do this? And, you know, what's the intellectual motivator? And the reason, at least what turns me on, is when you have, not hydrogen, but when you have heavier atoms and so forth, and they're partially ionized in a medium like this, for example, in the interior of the sun, what you have is an enormous, even in thermal equilibrium, you have an enormous multiplication of the set of states. So for instance, you know, famously growing out of my group uh, at Livermore and Carlos Iglesias and Forrest Rogers, you know, what is the opacity contribution of a partially ionized iron atom that's maybe only 1% of the total in the solar convection zone? That's a moderately complicated combinatorial problem because of all of the excitations of the states that can occur. And when I'll, I'll show you what a ghastly mess that turns into and why it's a hard problem. So it's very interesting. And oh, by the way, if we get a little hotter and or a little higher pressure than our megabar, you know, let's say about 20 volts at solid density, suddenly, as I said, radiation transfer becomes the dominant energy exchange in the medium and brings on enormous challenges that we'll see shortly. Okay, now, what's the go-to experimental tool that shows up ubiquitously, particularly because I'm talking to you about radiation transfer? It's the whole round. And, and it's, of course, shown here in its uh, putative role in laser fusion. Um, it need not necessarily be the centimeter size that's shown here, but it's basically a key plasma heat engine. And what does it do, okay? It takes the lasers and turns them into a quasi-Planckian thermal bath that then drives things possibly quite uniformly or could bring a sample to thermal equilibrium at a temperature that's appropriate for that Planckian drive. And so what I'm saying is you're taking, you know, maybe, and it's shown here in numbers actually, you know, uh, uh, you know NIF has 192 beams. It could have been a smaller laser system, smaller, haha, you know, like the Nova laser that we had with 10 beams. And so it, it terawatts per beam. This is a lot of juice and so forth. We can reach temperatures that are pretty close to thermal equilibrium inside of this little metal can, you know, that approach the numbers on the side here. This is the radiation temperature, you know, that can get up to 300 uh, volts or something like that, which is uh, typically used in laser fusion. Okay, but we also use it as an experimental platform to bring samples or radiation transfer experiments to these unusual conditions, and that's really the theme of the talk. Um, and then there's a little bit of blather here about laser fusion, but I'm going to talk more about the physics things. Okay, so this is a very large scale um, experiment. Many of you may recognize this picture. This, of course, is our target chamber, but it was also the stage set for the engine of the Enterprise in the Star Trek episode, Into Darkness. Uh, some cynics in the audience would say that's all we're good for is making stage props. It was pretty cool. I mean, this alien person here presumably knows all about how to use laser fusion to drive things, and so he's there to, you know, it's like Scotty in The Next Generation. Actually, this is the Scotty follow along right there uh, to, uh, to get enormous power and go beyond and so forth. So that's the scale of what we're talking about about in this system, it's, it's enormous. So it's taking 192 lasers, you know, with an aggregate of petawatts of energy and cramming it into a cubic centimeter and seeing what you get. And, you know, you get cool movies. Okay, and this is the target that you get when you, that's what all of that juice goes into. You saw a picture of the final optics assembly there, you know, uh, you know bringing the light in. By the way, those are larger optics assemblies than on the Keck telescope uh, into a little box like this um, over the course of nanoseconds or in some cases hundreds of picoseconds. Okay, now let, let's get a little serious about the physics here. 
This is a, um, an example that I would, you know, if you really want to get into this subject, this is an example I'd, I'd alert you to go check out. So this is Maria Barrios and her collaborators at, at our lab. Um, a really beautifully done experiment. This is a, 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 a um, section of a NIF-sized whole round that is beautifully diagnosed. So there's a diagnostic capsule in the center because you want to understand the temperature and the heat flow here. And it's got um, sort of um, diagnostic material pasted on this little ball that's a mixture of uh, manganese and cobalt. And the energy um, that's here is sufficient to ionize these two things so that you get K-shell emission. We're going to get complicated here shortly, but K-shell emission is a basic diagnostic, and you can see some of her data here uh, showing, you know, it's a little hard to read, but, you know, classic, you know, spectral lines, helium alpha, helium beta, so these are, this is a pretty ionized set of these things, you know, like 40, 45 times ionized or something. And the relative strength of these lines, you know, for example, analyzed by Dwayne Liedahl, who's in my group using a genetic algorithm method is a very, very fine-tuned way to determine what's really going on in the temperature of this, these structures as a function of time. We use street cameras a lot. This is a typical streak picture uh, that's quite precise. And these are some of the pictures of the temperature histories here. So one feels, you know, one's really got an understanding of what's going on. And so this is using, you know, detailed K-shell spectroscopy of mid-Z elements that are very strategically placed in the interior of the whole realm and so forth. And with a, you know, time-dependent spectrometer, these are nanosecond time scales, which is by, you know, our standards, relatively long pulse. Um, and uh, as I said, there's another class of experiments that are typically more done with short pulse lasers that go down even below picoseconds. So, but, but this is long pulse uh, pertinent to this system. Okay, let's uh, begin a little bit to talk about a thought experiment for energy transfer in these systems. And I tried to convince you a moment ago that the whole round, this little gold can that you saw next to that person's eyeball, is the energy converter engine of this system. And so how does it work? How does the energy really get propagated around? And what do we want to know about the atomic physics of this system in order to figure out what's going on here? So. This is the thought experiment. Imagine that we were in the inside of that can and we have a wall here and radiation that's come to us, you know, produced maybe on the other side or something that came from the laser conversion is impinging upon this wall and then heating gold, for example, here and producing a, um, a heat diffusion wave that's propagating into the system. So one question is, and by the way, we want to know this because of the energy balance in the system. One question is, how fast does the energy leave? You know, for example, we want to heat up a capsule and make it ignite. Does it all go sideways? A lot of it actually does go sideways out through the thing, through this heat diffusion. And how does it re-radiate? Kirchhoff's law, remember, very important. Um, and so let's write down a simple equation. So what controls the energy flux through this wall when these when the soft x-rays hit the system? Well. It's the diffusive energy flux. Its gradient is equal to the local time rate of change of the energy density. No argument there. How does it work in this case? And now we're in the regime where radiation begins to dominate, not the energy density. It's not radiation dominated in this case in the sense of cosmology or something like that, but it's radiation transfer dominated. That means on the right-hand side of the equation, there are two terms in a plasma context. There's, this is the more vanilla one, it may not look like it, it's the heat transfer due to electron conduction, electron velocity, mean free path and so on is here, and the energy density in the electrons, and then assuming a quasi planckian you know, local thermal equilibrium uh, thing here, uh, there is the gradient due to the diffusion of radiation energy density, T to the fourth density. So that means that this, that this diffusion equation is a nonlinear diffusion equation. You might be used to hearing this referred to as a Marshak wave after Marshak who discovered it, um, but it's really not a wave, it's really nonlinear diffusion, but because it's nonlinear and because of the variation of the opacity with temperature, the actual profile of the wave, uh, of, the, of the diffusion is pretty wave-like. It's got a profile that very abruptly ends at a very specific point, and it slides through the medium, sucking energy out of the wall in that direction. So the key number, and oh, by the way, the left-hand side of the equation, uh, again, we're not doing cosmology here, so the t to the fourth component of the, um, of the energy density is not typically relevant here. You could imagine cases where it is relevant, but I'm not speaking about those today. 
um, the the it's really the you know the just the energy density of the of the matter is what matters. So it's really the time derivative of this term is equal to the, really this term. This one being irrelevant. Um, so you know for those who are radiation transfer aficionados, this is called the Rossel and mean free path. Dates back to the early 20s, I think, when, when people began to look at this issue in astrophysics. And it's the thing that controls how fast energy is transferred in the system. So if you imagined, I showed you some K-shell things a moment ago. You'll see more complex things momentarily. If you imagine a very complicated spectrum, the mean free path seen as diffusion in frequency space means it's diffusing through the gaps between the lines. That's what makes this a hard problem. It's not the Planck opacity which cares about the peaks of the spectrum, you know, and the energy content. It's about leaking through windows in the Venetian blinds of your spectrum. That's the issue and we're going to get into how do you get at that. It's a hard question. You know, written down formally, if you look at the, uh, at the equation of radiation transfer, it's equal, to the it's equal to the frequency integral of the reciprocal of what's called the Rossland opacity, because uh, we're looking at a mean free path, it's reciprocal, times the derivative of the Planck function at the temperature in question, and then divide, normalized by its integral. Because this question of leaking through the gaps between the spectral lines was so complex, you know, people were at a total loss as to how to get at this, actually. Um, the question was first raised at Los Alamos during the 1940s, and then uh, two stu students of Maria Mayer, who I, th I think uh, Harris Mayer, not a relation, is still living and working at Los Alamos, had the first go at this, but people were wondering, how do we really know this stuff is right? So uh, enter uh, Jeremy Bernstein and Freeman Dyson in the 1950s, who got very clever and um, you know, showed using a very uh, cute application of the Schwartz inequality, or the Schwartz is with you, um, you know, taking this formula and so forth and using the Thomas Sirica Kuhn sum rule and then getting a very neat upper bound on the Rossland opacity, which looks like this. So th this is in units that are, we, we go per unit mass. So this is centimeter squared cross section per gram. That's the Rydberg in whatever units you like. And that's the, um, this is LTE. That's the uh, equilibrium electron temperature in the medium. So with the stuff I'm going to show you a little later, you ought to mentally compare with that number, this sort of 10 to the fifth, this sort of number, you know, let's say at hundreds of volts dividing into a Rydberg, so therefore divided by a factor of 100 or so. Um, it turned out, I was actually in a funny correspondence with, with uh, Freeman uh, many, many years after this where I and I think others pointed out to him, if you kind of cheated with the Thomas Reichakun sum rule and put down um, you know, Z star, which is the effective ionization state of the atoms or the ions, I should say, in the system, you get a much better value than what they had actually. So it was kind of an interesting discussion. But anyway, they, they made this very clever observation at the time. Whoops, yeah. So this is an example of the, of the uh, and this is even just the beginning of it, uh, kind of advertising you know, some of the nice work that came out of my group years before I was there. So this is um, you know, like really getting at the astrophysical opacities, for example, um, of iron in the sun, which is a big part and is still a big part of the standard solar model. Um, this is a calculation that Carlos Iglesias did with his and uh, Forrest's uh, opal opacity code showing a lot of the spectral line structure. Notice the units up here. So uh, let's say this, is, this was at 20 volts, so that's almost it's pretty much a Rydberg. So you know, I was telling you that the bound is kind of up here. Uh, you'll notice the other thing about this is that you know, the cross sections of lines like this varies as drawn here by orders and orders of magnitude. So this is a challenging question is to figure out you know, what the diffusion between these lines is. XSN is kind of, a, kind of a horse that you'd want to beat. It's an old school opacity code based on average atom that, gee, we're better than that. Well, okay. You know. um, the, uh, this has continued to be a very interesting subject as we'll see shortly. A thing like this is begging you to use statistical mechanics or something like that to form some kind of statistical analysis of these lines to, to get clever. I mean, the, the, the Dyson bound is just one example. Then maybe you could go further than that. And in fact, it's a sort of open question, in my opinion, that maybe someone here will solve uh, is, is a way to get a better crack on these things other than calculating into exquisite detail. And this, is, this has been influential in many astrophysical studies. For example, getting Cepheid pulsation uh, period ratios correct and so forth. Uh, really quite nice. So let's take a crack at trying to uh, do something like this. So in the atomic physics community, 
Um, people weren't lost on the analogy with statistical work done in nuclear physics with random matrix models and things like that for nuclear level statistics. So they thought, hey, let's do some stuff like this in atomic physics. And indeed, there was success in that regard that led to viable opacity codes to get good values for not just the Rossland opacity, but the multi-group opacity to really take an understanding of how these systems trade energy with themselves. So this is an example of a calculation. Uh, I think this is presented by Marcel Klapisch, who's one of the inventors of this method going back to the 70s, uh, along with Jacques and Claire Bosch um, uh, in France. Um, and this shows a bunch of spectral lines from what we call a transition array. So this says that I'm in, I'm in uh, molybdenum, let's, K, let's say, ionization state 15 plus, so there's a lot of electrons left to play, and we're looking at all of the spectral lines that occur between you know, a configuration that's like a 3D8 and a 4F going down to a 3D9, there's lots of them, right? And, you know, and they all depend on the collective field of what the electrons are doing, it's kind of involved. And so this is a bit of that analysis here. And what was discovered uh, first by them looking at, it was really driven by experiments for these unresolved transition arrays. What was discovered is that they obeyed very simple sum rules. Namely, the moment distribution of this unresolved transition array is controlled by one or two very simple Slater integrals for the full atomic physics problem, which is an enormous simplification and an enticement to go further into this. Um, so having done that, notice this goes back to the, some of the laser plasma experiments of the late 70s, uh, going forward a decade, and there's Bill Goldstein, our director, a, a very, very nice piece of work he did with Avi Barshalom and company here. Uh, they realized you could make an opacity code out of these observations that the Boches and the Klapisch uh, uh, paper showed. And so um, this led to the concept of what's called a super transition array, which is an enormous statistical um, improvement over the analysis of these things. So for example, you know, just to kind of torment the audience here, um, you know, if you were in some atomic system and there, was, and there was a series of transitions between two S states and large numbers of P electrons, D DCA means detailed configuration, that means all of the atomic physics, that's your homework problem. You know, it's, it's summarized by a single STA, but one that obeys these special sum rules. And this is just to say that we build our opacity codes out of these things with, I must say, marvelous success. Uh, so we're really getting a crack at the original problem I told you about, which is energy flow in these systems. Uh, this is a calculation Daniel Aberg and my contingent did, which is solid density iron. Uh, again, showing this absorption cross-section at about 200 volts. And again, mentally compare this to the bound that Dyson had there and so forth, which is actually far above this and so forth. So this is what's really going on in these systems. So, so this is um, you know, what's going on with local thermal equilibrium. Now this is not just a mathematical exercise or one that we use to predict things that are going on in Outre experiments, but it's had an immediate impact here. In, uh, this is not a laser experiment, by the way. This is work of Jim Bailey and company from Sandia with the Z machine, um, looking at the solar convection zone opacity in iron and nearby elements you know, like vanadium, chromium, and so forth in the periodic table. And so his experimental data relative to a typical calculation, for example, we would have done, or this is Stephanie Hansen's code, SCRAM, um, you know, in comparison to these things at different, uh, this is electron densities in the, in the medium, um, so somewhat dilute, probably tenth of a gram per cc at the ionization balance, and then different temperatures here that are, that are about 180, 190 electron volts, which is pertinent to that part of the sun. Um, and you know, here's a typical streak data image. And the message from this is striking. The original reason to have done these experiments was because new photometric observations showed that probably the solar um, element abundances weren't correct. And therefore, the opacity and radiation transfer in the sun wasn't correct. Uh, this connects to, to you know, the um, sort of like the geology or you know, the helioseismology of the sun, the vibration modes. And there was a puzzle that's developing in the astrophysical community, but it could be resolved if these opacities were actually not the ones we calculate, but they were much bigger. Well, what Bailey found was even more extreme than that. Not only were they bigger, but they were crazy bigger. They're hard to understand how they could be this big. And when you get into the atomic physics details, it's got strange features like a lot of the transition arrays, a little hard to see here and so forth, and his data are flattened as if the oscillator strength is weirdly spread out to the side and, and stuff like that. And so, the, and so it's a real experimental challenge 
to figure out what's going on here. And by the way, this will animate again, are we really telling you the truth that we've got under control, computing these enormous transition arrays to understand the energy flow in systems we care about? So this, uh, of course, took place several years ago. And so we're now doing laser experiments in the same, uh, in the same arena. This is preliminary data. Uh, uh, spectrally taken data, or a little over a kilovolt in, in transmission energy. Uh, first NIF data of these things and so forth with their error bars shown underneath Jim's data from Sandia. And this is at a lower temperature where there was not much contention about the theory. So this is preliminary work, but it looks like it matches quite well. The experiments are going on now to uh, see you know, what's going on up closer to 200 volts where the giant discrepancy opened up. And you know, I think uh, when Ted Perry and company are ready to go public with this, some kind of food fight is gonna take place in, in the astrophysical community and also elsewhere. Uh, the actual target is shown over here. Um, and it has a, uh, you have to make a backlighter that can actually shine energy through the thing to look at the transmission to see the opacity. And that's what this little dot is down here that's heated in directly by the laser. So there's quite a bit of control. Andrew. Uh, what is the idea behind why this high temperature radiated flux would increase the opacity so much? Is there a conceptual idea? Well, um, the, 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 um, you mean what would explain his results? So what, why? No, actually, uh, the, 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 um, if you restricted yourself to single electron transitions, um, the, the conundrum is quite bad because, again, to, in a little bit of a technical point here, if you look at cold matter where all the electrons are ready to play and it's not continuum scattering, which is negligible, if, if you just have all bound states like cold iron or something like that, these opacities are bigger than that. So it's really hard to understand. He's great, but it's really hard to understand his results in the sense of one electron you know, um, you know, scattering and, and absorption, uh, sorry, one photon ab absorption. Now, there are radicals who think, and I think they're, they're in the process of being proven wrong by a young guy in my group also, uh, Michael Cruz, uh, that, that somehow there's some secret two photon processes or things like that going on. Um, I think that's pretty unlikely. Uh, because the number of photons per mode that's available in the Z-pinch machine is probably less than one. You know, it's a quasi-thermal source and it's diluted geometrically. So it's hard to believe nonlinear optics explains this. So it's an open question as to why one could have results like that. Um, you know, at the temperatures he sees. And, you know, it's like a lot of things like this. Is we're going to learn a lot from sorting this out. So anyway. Um, okay. Okay, so um, I've taken you through a quick tour, both uh, uh, ridiculous theory and statistics and so forth, and some experiments on local thermal equilibrium radiation transfer. Now I'd like to turn, um, in the time available, to non-local thermal equilibrium, which is when we don't have the hypothesis that the system is being brought to thermal equilibrium, and I guess I'm okay on time. Um, and so let's, let's discuss the physics of that a little bit. It's got a lot going on that has many, many open questions and invite people to think about this. So this is a sort of a hydrogenic caricature of an of a ion. Um, and let's talk, let's kind of cross-section talk our way through this for a second. It's got, you know, it's partially ionized, it's got continuum electrons and so forth. So there's an argument you can make about this due to Hans Grimm, uh, which looks like this. You can check this in his book. The upper levels, because they're closely spaced and they're being mixed all the time by collisions with the continuum electrons, are pretty well thermalized. You know, those of you who even deal with tokamaks know that the very high Rydberg states and so forth tend to look like they're coming to thermal equilibrium, even though the density is incredibly small. But the lower lying states, which are ones here, undergo strong radiative decay, and there's no radiation to pump them back up again, let's say in most systems, in my systems there are. Um, and so these guys empty out, and the system goes out of equilibrium. And so that uh, contrast, and the question is, are collisions strong enough at a given, let's say, principal quantum number to bring us to thermal equilibrium or not? So, so this is an equation that Hans writes down as a function of the principal quantum number, the effective temperature and such things. And it is just the balance between the radiative decay rate of the state and the tendency of collisions to repopulate it because we're not allowing radiation for the time being. And so this is the story. So basically, lower density systems <coughs> tend to go out of equilibrium. What a surprise. Um, and, and then, of course, radiation plays a really big role that I haven't addressed properly. Okay, so this is an example of, uh, I guess, years ago when I got involved, it's a calculation that I did that shows this effect. This is with a rather, 
you know, soft pedal, wimpy, average atom, non-equilibrium opacity coat. It's aluminum at a thousandth of a gram per cc with an electron temperature of, a, uh, of 50 volts. And uh, this, this just shows the, the opacity again in units of centimeters squared per gram. As you go through the system, notice that you know varies by orders of magnitude. There's the results of lines and so forth. These are free bound continuum effects and so forth, which are just look on this graph at least like they grow linearly, you know, photoionization basically in absorption. And so uh, the point here though is that at this density, the criterion that Green wrote down is not satisfied. And so you can see down here in the absence of radiation that the emissivity of a given system um, is well below the absorption and so because they're not equal to each other you see Kirchhoff's law is not obeyed so we're out of equilibrium which is what I was telling you on the other hand if you turn on a Planckian radiation field at 50 electron volts you get this result in this calculation which is the two lines are on top of each other namely you are in thermal equilibrium so we want to understand these systems better this is a point example of this okay now this is supposed to torment the audience actually if you were really you know since we're out of equilibrium what are you going to do like who are you going to call right well, you're going to solve some ridiculously big kinetic system for the system. And, you know, we do a lot of that stuff in X-ray lasers. We did a lot of that. And here's an example. It's actually not, you know, it's what we really would do is some of the kinetics processes. It's like a chemistry set where all kinds of reactions are going on between different ions in the system. There are processes like autoionization, photoionization, you know, bound state absorption, all this stuff. And even at the master equation level, which is all I'm going to do in this talk, you are solving a system of equations like this. Seems very simple with uh, rate matrices that take me from states J to state I or back again. And I'm looking at my populations. They could, of course, very well be time dependent. And this is a huge confusing situation and what I'm about to tell you is we want to get at this and again this is going to apply to whole realms and you know with recent discoveries um, it turns out that there's a much neater way to do this using ideas of non-equilibrium thermodynamics so aha here comes Lars Onsager to the rescue so, you know if you really took seriously a crazy picture like that I showed and went to a relatively heavy atom you know, you might convince yourself you need to pay attention to a million or a hundred million states, all even allowed trend, dipole allowed, whatever you want, allowed transitions between those things, autoionization. You know, there could be a trillion uh, uh, links in the system. And oh, by the way, seen from the viewpoint of an applied mathematician, it's very ill characterized because the condition number of the system is bad because the rates are so different and so on. You know, you don't want to go there. Basically, well, you can't, at least not in this epoch. But the, uh, the idea um, that, 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 that uh, several of us played with, you know, down here, I guess, um, is can you package all of this information in a way that is really looking at the heat flow in the system? Because that's what you actually really care about in radiation transfer. You don't care that this particular level auto-ionized and the electron went here or something like that. What you do care about is what is the net energy flux in the system? And let's keep in mind that we're talking about a radiatively dominated system here. So we need to keep track of that. Um, so the question is, can we, whoops, can we package the uh, information of this master equation in a heat flow kind of way that Onsager would have approved of and look at entropy flow, for example, in the system. It turns out to be a valuable way to look at this. And, and just a quick advertisement, I'm not going to talk about it. Several other people in my orbit have tried other methods with some success. For example, Monte Carlo exploration of the, uh, of the rate matrix and things like that, uh, which is valuable, but you know, I, don't have, I don't have time now to go into it. So we're going to talk about Onsager-esque near equilibrium steady state characterization. So what are some of the problems? We, we were doing whole realms. Let's bring it back there. You know, you know, what are some of the problems we might address? I, sh I talked to you about the equilibrium heat flow into the system and wanting to use it to drive things as I go along, but that's only an approximation. Actually, I'm not quite in equilibrium, and I want to understand this and eventually use this, for example, to drive the samples I'm interested in in experiments, ignition capsules, and the rest of it. You know, because the ability to compute the non-equilibrium behaviors of this to drive a capsule involves those trillions you know, of, of rates and so forth uh, between states, and no one does a good calculation of it in the past. That has now changed. 
So what are some of the things you want to do? So for example, suppose you had an otherwise equilibrium system, but you added a beam of photons given frequency subscript here that we'll call the X-ray laser that comes into the system and perturbs the thing about, away from equilibrium. Here's another idea. I'm interested in the wall of that system, and I want to compute what happens when a shock escapes from the system, because you know we bang these things around a fair bit with a lot of energy. And so when the shock escapes from the system, I am worried about what happens when uh, this side heats up a little extra and there are photons escaping, so I'm off planking for that reason. Or the kind of experiments I've been touting, which is where I have a sample, but the whole realm itself is not in equilibrium. It was made out of gold and it has some atomic physics structure that's not quite Planckian, has what's called the M-band radiation, which is off Planckian and is significant uh, in these experiments. So, um, so what have I done when I've gone to this situation? I've gone from those trillions of crazy rates at this granular um, master equation level and I'm packaging them into groups of energy radiation flow or radiation groups in the system. So for example, I might only care about 50 radiation groups in a rather small space. That's a big improvement. And I'm going to package all this stuff there. And what's even better about this is if I look at the perturbation to the Planckian behavior in the system, I'm really asking the question about deviations from Kirchhoff's law. This is the emission opacity and this is the absorption opacity. They're supposed to be equal in thermal equilibrium. And I have temperatures off equilibrium at various places and there is a, a linear response matrix that tells me what the impact is if I, let's say, it, let's say I was 50 volts and I went off equilibrium by pu pumping the system at 100 volts. There's feedback just from atomic physics that's going to leak into what goes on at 20 volts and so forth, just from various rates in the system. This is what this linear response matrix uh, does for me. An analogy that we'll pursue um, more directly is it's like the most simple example of linear response, Ohm's law or something like this. This is the resistance of the system in some sense, but it's a giant matrix in this case that uh, talks between the different radiation groups and can we get a handle on things with that? So it's a very nice matrix because it's way better than the atomic physics methods we usually have, and this says that, basically. Um, what we've talked about here so far, by the way, is for quasi-steady state system, which is correct for the whole realms driven at the National Ignition Facility, um, is not true for short pulse laser uh, setups and so forth. So it's more specific whole realm type applications. Um, let's talk about the thermodynamics of this system a little bit. You know, I mean, Bob, you mentioned, you know, minimum entropy production and so forth. That's what's going on here. So we can imagine the following thought experiment to talk about how samples are interacting with this near equilibrium system. So there's my sample. And by the way, some of you may recognize this picture, although it's got little mini whole realm guns here. This one's aiming a Planckian out at me at, at a temperature T1. This is aiming a Planckian into the system so they all intersect with the sample at temperature temperature T2 and so forth, each of these are a different effective frequency. So I mean really the number of photons per mode that's coming out of this thing is, you know, 1 over e to the beta h nu minus 1 with a different beta. Those are the T1s for these cases, right? And they all come over here and cause the system to be highly conflicted because it's, it's interacting with multiple, you know, conflicting quasi-Planckian backgrounds from different sources. Now, um, why this thing involves a minimum entropy reduction is the following thing. The sample is in steady state, so no entropy is being produced in the sample. What it's doing is the, the sample is a translation engine. It's taking energy at a given Planckian and spitting it back at other places that go back into these devices. And the fact that I've thermostated these things at temperatures T1, T2, T3, and T4 at each of their frequencies, it's going to cost me, when the energy goes back into the system, I have to both put heat in the system to get it at its correct temperature because it's wanting to cool off, or the reverse, um, is, 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 is go the other way and cool it off if it's heating up too much. And so uh, the entropy reduction are in these external heat engine sources. And in fact, the whole insight Onsager had is, uh, not for this specific problem, but in general, is the aggregate of that energy production is a minimum for the system, which is, which is a very powerful principle. And this just describes it, again, for this aluminum plasma. Th th these equations on the left pretty much state what I did. It works out 
where the entropy production is. It's in the reservoirs and it just obeys a simple equation in terms of the response matrix. This is back to my uh, screened model here for aluminum. This shows what happens as you dri are driven off equilibrium by my pulsing the system at 50 electron volts. The response matrix says, oh, this one got hotter. That one actually got cooler, and a whole bunch of things are going on here. And then, the, then as Onsager showed, the matrix is symmetric, and it goes back the other way in the system. So we are having minimum entry reduction in the reaction box. The thing that some of you might have recognized that I neglected to say was uh, we stole this idea. This is in chemistry called the Van Hoff reaction box for chemistry where you have different chemicals that are slightly off equilibrium entering a reaction spot and so forth. So if you look at some of the old you know, thermodynamics books, uh, you know, um, coming back from a century ago, you can see the Van Hoff reaction box and that's where we got the idea. Um, Oh, look at all this spinach. Well, so what, what, what to take away from this is the following thing, is there were those 10 to the 12 reaction rates in the master equation. And this is the formula down here that tells you how to package them in terms of this matrix, our, uh, our uh, new new prime here, which is the response matrix in radiation group space. So these are the Einstein A coefficients for the different transitions, there's appropriate energy scalings, and then you have this Q matrix, which is really a matrix that tells me how a pair of levels like those two over there, you know, wanting to have a, you know, a D to P transition or something like that, respond to my tweaking the energy flow in the system over here. So it's a giant pairwise response matrix. And um, this has turned out to work out very well. So I told you a little while ago that, that, that you know, people who had tried very hard to model you know, the non-equilibrium thermodynamics of the drive of fusion capsules by the, um, by the lasers driving the whole round and, you know, weren't getting things quite precise enough and so forth. It turns out that when we modify in the codes the, the radiation transfer using this linear response idea, packaging everything in terms of the R matrix and expanding things out clearly, keeping a little track of the Maxwellian electron temperature and some other niceties, you, it works out extraordinarily well. This is a toy calculation of the interior of a whole realm in a cutaway view um, as a function of length in both directions of a, uh, our linear response method calculation and a calculation done with an equivalent non-equilibrium model. The truth of the model isn't the point. The point is that the packaging of the equations into these, into these radiation group flows works very well. So what this enables is the following thing, because what we've done is, like you mentioned, you know, like my old life factorization, what we've done is we've factorized the equations of non-equilibrium radiation transfer. So we've taken the hard part, which is the inline kinetics calculation, and we pre-compute that as a large response matrix for whatever atomic model we'd like. It isn't limited by time anymore because you compute it offline with your favorite atomic physics. And then it's picked up as a table by the equations of radiative transfer and it works quite well. For example, you could have a drive a capsule. This is a toy capsule. Notice it's in joules here. And you can't even see the difference between the two calculations. It works so well. And it's actually extraordinary that it does because linear response, of course, is not the whole story in a non-equilibrium situation. Far from it. Um, the most obvious point is that um, um, you know, things that go in cycles, like a maser cycle or something like that, are not correctly described by linear response. And it would appear in this case, at least in goal, that that's not a serious effect. Because these calculations are, will run with equivalent atomic physics, at a minimum already demonstrated thousands of times faster than the standard calculations, and probably if people get clever far more than that, this is going to enable calculations in, in much more realistic geometries and so forth that one would want to use probably in these days um, something colleagues are doing, you know, using machine learning interpolation basically between large sets of multi-D calculations that really should inform laser fusion and other applications. So that's uh, to come, you know. Um, there are more theorems that this response matrix obeys and so on, which leads to other 
you know, other places in non-equilibrium thermodynamics that are very interesting. For example, I just mentioned that Maser cycles and so forth are illegal in linear response. There's a kind of almost Bianchi identity here that we proved that makes it look like that that's true. Um, no, I mean, it is true. It looks like a Bianchi identity, quite interesting. And so, you know, the future we'll see how we can apply these other ideas. My personal one is to try to add the cycles back into the system in perturbation theory, but, but uh, hasn't been done yet natural step is to account for cyclical steady states. You know, now the fun thing about giving a physics lecture to an audience is you show a picture like this and every single person in the room recognizes this from both reading that lecture, knowing who's in the picture, and, and kind of collectively enjoying the moment. So this is a favorite chapter of mine and probably half of you in the Feynman lectures, um, you know, where he describes his lifelong passion for variational methods and it's quite a passion. Um, and the thing that I like about this so much um, is the, of course, the beautiful physics description of this subject, um, but he's asking key questions. Now, this was written in the early 60s, is to what extent do these kind of ideas that I described at a master equation level, you know, obey in a truly quantum mechanical system? I mean, here we're taking quantum rates, but it's not really full quantum mechanics. And it's very, very relevant to what we're doing and, and prescient. I would also add, for people who want to have a little fun with this, you know, obviously resistor networks are intrinsically linear response, and so that you can have a little bit of fun with this, with this theorem of minimum entropy reduction. You know, Go is a homework problem. Pick a crazy complicated resistor network that you would normally solve with Kirchhoff's two laws. The point is you only need one of them, which is current conservation, and then the minimum of the I squared R loss and so forth, and it gives a quite good answer, as it's supposed to, of course. Um, so that's, that's great fun and, and ties back to Feynman. Um, uh, I want to mention one other subject. There must be at least one string theorist here. You. So, um, uh, again, transport, but not radiation transport. And so this is, this is like a quick tease at the end of the talk. Um, it is unknown, generally. Um, you know, we're sort of, you know, I wanted to keep things tied to experiment and kept going, whole room, whole room, radiation transfer, driving things. It's unknown in the kind of systems that we're dealing with whether viscosity makes any difference at all. Most of the codes that we run are Eulerian codes. They're in a very high nominal Reynolds number limit, but it's not clear that viscosity is unimportant. Um, and, for example, for the saturation of Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities and also things that occur at, at, you know, back on that megabar pressure level at a few electron volts. So I want to point out a very fun thing. You know, there's a, again, to the, to the one string theorist here, you know, the, uh, you know, there's a beautiful paper by, I think, Kavta et al., you know, that argues, you know, from gravity duels that uh, there is a minimum value of the viscosity per entropy density, which is h-bar over 4 pi k Boltzmann. This sort of ties back to a marvelous thing in the past. Remember, Edward Purcell used to ask, why is water like the least viscous stuff? You know, who, who wrote that law? And, you know, maybe this is part of the answer to that question. Um, and, you know, there's a kind of very rough physics argument for why this is true, which is in that paper in a lot of other places, which is basically uh, that the viscosity just in dimensional analysis is, let's say in terms of quasi-particles in the system, is, a, is the energy of a particle, its density times the scattering time, that's just dimensional analysis. Similarly, if we're, if we're looking at the quasi-particle density, the entropy density looks like this. And if you take the ratio of those, what do you get, in, including the uncertainty principle, you get h-bar over k Boltzmann. So, um, uh, the paper, though, ends with a tantalizing comment that graphs of this function of the viscosity per entropy density, let's say as a function of temperature and some density, look the same for superheated water, for liquid helium, for nitrogen. Hmm. So one day, you know, and this, this is really how some at least a little bit fun science happens. I, I was bored and I had a table of reactor materials on my desk for some reason. And I went and computed the same thing that was in this paper for sort of like half volt sodium. And lo and behold, it was the same, okay? Because all, you know, all the thermal numbers are in this book. Isn't that interesting? So, so like just on that megabar one um, volt per atom kind of level, it looked like this is exactly the same as what, what they were talking about with these other materials. So. Um, so I ran into a French colleague of mine, Gerald Fossurier, 
uh, who visited us, and he said, oh, no, no, he said, he said, you know, forget the string people. He said, the, you know, Rosenfeld pointed this out, you know, you know, 20 years ago and so forth in a series of really beautiful Morstat Mech community papers. You know, some of the, I didn't put down the full references. They go back to the uh, early 70s, I think, and so forth. Um, and indeed, we took a look at this and so forth. So, so got to working a little bit with Gerald and, and, and um, his colleague Silvestrelli. And so this is a, a result of a calculation that we did, um, you know, looking at this in various relatively detailed, this is modeling calculation, this isn't data, you know, of the viscosity per entropy density in the units of the four pi, you know, you know, H bar over four pi K Boltzmann. Uh, and rather similar to this, this case, and rather different than Toma and Morfield said in an earlier paper that looked at this, and I think March and company have a paper uh, that shows that this doesn't get anywhere near the bound, which is good news, I guess. It's like 100 times the bound, so it's pretty interesting. And a colleague of mine, when I was sort of assembling this talk the other day, told me this might have an interesting application, or so he said, Peter Ament. Um, and the application is this, is people um, looking at, at, at um, our uh, ignition capsules are looking at the following kind of issue, and people here in plasma physics probably know this, is if you have a shock wave, and let's say the capsule, the, the fuel is deuterium and tritium, you have, it crosses an interface. It turns out, just for um, thermodynamic reasons again, the deuteriums and tritiums tend to separate, actually. So the question is, how much do they separate? You know, so for example, suppose the implosion is good, but they've separated a lot over, let's say, the course of yay many nanoseconds, and let's say they, which they probably don't, but let's say they stayed separated. Well, you know, you're not going to get the fusion reactions you would hope for, right? So it's pretty significant. And Peter thought that because that process occurs, at least with the first shocks in the system, um, that he thought that this viscosity minimum you know, that's the damping process by which these things would not do this. So he was really eager, you know, um, probably doesn't like me representing his, his thing like this because we haven't done any work on it, but he was really eager to look into this question. So in little niches here, you know, maybe not in the big hydrodynamic sense is viscosity, including this interesting factoid about minimum uh, uh, shear viscosity per entropy density might well proved to be interesting uh, for these systems. So a third topic in transport. And then finally, let me summarize a little bit what you heard here. Um, you know, we talked primarily, because it's my bag, I guess, about transport physics and high energy density, uh, and comparing it to experiment going all the way from K-shell spectroscopy as a temperature and other diagnostic for what's going on inside to rather complex radiation opacities to out of equilibrium packaging those things using statistical methods, uh, actually both in equilibrium and out of equilibrium kind of Onsager ideas that seem to have some success um, in the factorization of the equation of radiation transfer, and then this kind of tantalizing thing about viscosity, uh, which is kind of fun. And then lastly, I wanted to say, and this is probably just a partial list, you know, I've been you know, I've worked on a lot of things, like Bob said, but, but you know, I've off and on been involved in HED physics since I went to Livermore, and I have a lot of colleagues who've, who've been crucial to all of this, and this is probably, I probably miss people, this is, a, this is probably a subset, and they represent many different institutions, a lot of Livermore people, you know, but, but you know, Bailey I mentioned, you know, uh, you know, you know, in Sandia, Avi Barshalom, you know, was in Demona, Jacques Bosch is, you know, from uh, University of Paris, and, you know, the list goes on, he's our, Bill Goldstein is our director, and so forth, so with that, I will stop. Uh, questions are allowed, too. So. So, that was sudden. Uh, sudden, yeah. All right, so we have time for a few more people, for two people. Yeah. In high density, just to limit it, very high density, in the radiative transport, which is, you is the process basically a lot of emissions and absorption? Yes, exactly. Or is it, a, is it, or is it instead emission in the wing? Uh, is it, the, uh, I know, I think it, well, years it, back, Holstein brought up. Yes, the right, right, right. How does it bear on? on well, so, 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 um, uh, a couple of things. So Holstein, I'm a big fan of that paper you're alluding to, which, which um, 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 let, me, let me back up to the beginning of your question. So it's sort of both in, this, in the following sense. If you're in local equilibrium, the process is you absorb and emit and absorb and emit and you thermalize locally quite quickly. So then, it, so then for it to go further, it wants to go out in the wing because it can't go anywhere otherwise. And so it has a better mean free path. And so it's, it's the constant tension between those things. So which dominates? 
Uh, they both go together, actually, because of Kirchhoff's law, I think, actually. So that emission and absorption, you know, kind of go hand in hand. Um, so the, the, the... At one point, you mentioned the mean free path for a photon. Now, that, that sort, of, sort of seems like a good concept if right. photons on line center. But if it's going to be the rare emission in the wings, right. you, you could certainly define a mean free path but it's not too meaningful. So well, I, no, I, I uh, do. I disagree. I mean, I think I think it, it. You know, the mean free path in a naive sense is, you know, you know, what opacity does the medium present and absorption at that frequency? Frequency dependent. Yes. Oh, absolutely. So you, yeah, you know, you know, you know. Yeah, you know. I, I did. I, I get it. I, I slept over something when I spoke. You know, the when I wrote down the the Rossell and mean free path and that formula that I was joking around about Dyson from that was an average. Okay, of the of the average mean free path. However, when I was speaking about it physically, it, I was you know, and I should have said you're absolutely right. You know, I, I wanted a multi group picture where I'm I'm interested in the radiation in, a, in the the opacity in a frequency dependent way. Actually, the formula showed an average over that. But when I wrote lambda sub r, that was an average, and I didn't make that clear. Now, that, but I am a fan of this Holstein paper in another sense when I was doing uh, an X-ray laser, so now we're way out of equilibrium. You know, he, the, the ideas there and so forth are pertinent to radiation trapping in systems, actually. So this has to do with if you have a maser-like system and, um, and, you're, and, you're, and you're trying to pump things and so forth, it's, it's, um, you would worry, even in a three-level maser, let's say, you know, or a more complicated one that we have, but it's still the same thing, um, you would worry that the transition that you want to be what I call a refrigerator, basically, so that the lower laser state is, is, very, is not too heavily populated, you don't want that to get pumped also. And Holstein's equation shows when that does and doesn't come into play, and it ultimately has to do with how skinny the rod has to be. So it's a big deal. Um, yeah. So that's a, that's, a, that's a wonderful paper. Oh, slide seven. Boy, oh boy. You're <laughs> I'm going to get some surprise. I just know it. Let's see. Do we have numbers here? Uh, slide seven. 17, 16. Tell me when to stop. Since I don't have this very well labeled. Yes. The peak temperature one? Yes. Um, you know, it, it, it is actually. I mean, and so the, the, you know, you could imagine a setup where it isn't necessarily like that, but it, yes, yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great observation actually. It's a little weird at some it level. It, it is, it is. Um, and, and in fact, if, you know, um, uh, and it could be that, 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 they spe that she speaks to that in the paper that other setups actually might do this differently and importantly differently to sort of get at what's going on because, um, you, you know, this is a fun thing to talk about because, you know, we care about with the temperature and the drive fidelity over the entire sequence that was kind of, you know, was sort of uh, shown over here. Whoops. Well, that's silly. Um, you know, it, it's the lower right-hand picture, which is the long pulse story from some years ago. Um, you know, you care about the analog of that experiment over the entire 20 nanoseconds, and we know that we're not getting a lot of that right, probably. So it's it's important to design things that can probe those different times. So, yeah, that's that's a, that's very good. Yes. Is infrared divergence in QED a concern for your simulation since the application of the block noisy? approximation may not be valid in these non states? Um, interesting question. Um, I, I want to say I don't think so. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm smiling because I'm supposed to know about that subject. You know, this is my old QCD factorization days. Um, the, um, um, you, you know, so, so, so let, let me be more specific. So if I look at the sub-processes that, that operate in the system, that's of course pertinent to, to cases that have such divergences, such as the soft radiation from bremsstrahling, for example, or inverse bremsstrahling, which is, by the way, in this picture right here is the main heating mechanism. You can get fancy, but that's, you know, someone should have said to me, how does it actually heat up when the laser hits the wall? It's largely inverse bremsstrahling. Um, 
the modeling that we do ignores that typically. Um, and I think if I were to put my old field theory hat on, I think we're sort of assuming, um, an interesting question, we're sort of assuming that like the average quantities that typically is a sort of block Nordsic motivated way of doing it with some energy resolution is good enough for these cases. You know, it's maybe deserves a little bit more thought. I think in the highly non-equilibrium situations, you know, where you go even more, oh no, it's a big deal in those cases. So soft radiation, for example, you know, can modify things and, 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 and for sure there it matters. For example, if you're looking at, at you, know, um, you know, laser acceleration of particles or things like that, it's, it is very significant in those cases, but that's very far from this system. But I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, that's a good question. Basically, the second to last third of your talk about comparing capacity models. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't see experiments. Uh, so, are there any? Yeah, sure. I mean, so I, I did show some. I didn't spend enough time talking about them. So, let's flash through quickly. There's that. No. So, um, let's go over here for a second. Okay. So, these are older, so on the, on the right hand side, and I didn't discuss it at all because I felt some urgency to move along. So this is experimental data taken with a backlighter uh, here, so it's this one. Okay, so Paul Springer did this experiment at the Z machine years ago. So this is multi-group, you know, opacity measurements taken with an iron sample appropriate to this calculation. Um, the red is the experiment or the green? The green is the experiment, okay. And it's this, the, the, the red is a statistical model that here is being, it's this curve here is being sort of rejected as being unsatisfactory. Um, and um, so the green is Carlos and Forrest's code and, and the black is, 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 uh, is the experiment. And the, um, uh, you know, so this is taken with the backlighter and the driver is, is a, a Z pinch. Um, you know, there are, uh, so that one came out very well. Then there's another experiment, which of course is here being, this is Bailey's Z-pinch experiment and so forth, again for iron, but at a much higher temperature and higher density, maybe a tenth of a gram per cc. And then here you see NIF data, for example, compared to Bailey's data. So the NIF data is below. So this is, uh, you know, compared to. Um, Sorry, well, what theory is one comparing? Yeah, so this, so yeah, so that calculation is an STA based calculation uh, from our opacity code, basically. So, super transition array opacity. So that's the, that's the. The statistically. Uh, one. The which one? The kitchen sink one. It's got everything. No, it's not. This, this is the averaged one, actually, which uses statistical mechanics to average over, use Slater sum rules and stuff to average over stuff. So we do have a kitchen, actually in this regime, we do have kitchen sink predictions as well. And I think they match this decently as well, but I think this is the statistical one here. Well, so what it's getting at is, is there an experimental test of the minimum entropy shortcut? Ah, okay, for non-equilibrium. We've, <laughs> yeah, you guys ask all the great questions. We've been trying to devise a test of that. That is darn hard, okay, because, you, know, you, know, you know, and I've been hoping for this, but the, think about what you're asking, okay? You're, you're wanting to make a system controllably near equilibrium, but where it's off equilibrium by a very specific amount, or, or another way to say it is, what was the equation there? In groups, it was a pump probe experiment. Okay, so you're, 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 you're in equilibrium, but then you're pumping and probing the system, but not on spectral lines like in standard pump probe things. It's in um, radiation groups and so forth. So we're, we have been trying it. We don't have one. So that's not been demonstrated at all. Good. That was my answer. No. The answer is no. And it's darn hard. Okay, I like short answers. Yeah, so I, I wasn't obfuscating. Maybe you have an idea of how to design one. So. Of course I don't have an idea. That's why I asked the question. Yeah, sure. uh, any more questions? Anyway, so someone here is going to make a great invention in the subject. I know it. That's one I think we should quit. Thank okay. you very much. My pleasure. So I don't take the equipment away here.